I've got the post lunch phlegm going on. That's enjoyable. It's uh, the first thing that anybody wants to hear. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to my phlegm. <laughs> Classy. Classy. Yeah. I wonder how actors do it, like after lunch or whatever meal they get from craft services. Do they have a special like cleansing ritual to make sure that their voice is at like optimal volume? Yes. And, and they yes, do. they do. They have like vocal coaches. Like I mean, it varies by the person, as these things often do. Right. But a lot of it is about not eating foods that encourage that type of thing. Mm, um, yeah. A ton of rinses and mouthwash. Mm-hmm. Just doing mouthwash apparently makes a big difference, at least in the short term. I'd be very curious to know what Jared Leto's preferred preparation is, because I'm sure it's awful and horrifying. Some kind of vampire ritual from Eastern Bulgaria, I imagine. Well, only if that's the role that he's currently trying to inhabit. He doesn't. True. He inhabits a role. He's of that school of method acting, also known as abusing your coworkers. That's not always how it usually goes. (laughs) Only in like 95% of cases. Uh I'm amazed that they can get away with that. Like any other workplace, you would be immediately fired for that kind of behavior. But, you know, since you're on a on a studio and you're getting paid a lot of money to be there in theory, I guess you just you do what you want. I don't. You don't. But but he does, I guess is what I'm saying. No, if I was. Yeah, I guess uh, maybe. Hmm. Maybe I've just been role playing as a method actor my entire life. Think about it. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, man, I'm spiraling. Hello, alleged human, and welcome to the Chaos Lever podcast. My name is Ned, and I'm definitely not a robot. I'm a real human person capable of emulating human speech patterns using natural language and appropriate grammar. I am able to express in the full spectrum of human emotions and expressions such as empathy or humor. Ha 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 ha. Let's let's engage in lively banter to further ingratiate ourselves to our also human audience. Being human is swell. Don't you agree, Chris? Sometimes. Other times you wake up and your neck is so sore for reasons that you cannot explain. And explain it. This will You're just 40 persist <laughs> indefinitely. <laughs> I woke up this morning and my, my foot hurt. No reason. Just because. Yeah. Yesterday was a rest day. I didn't even like do any exercise. And I woke up today and my foot's like, yeah, you hurt. Go okay. take like six Advil. Yeah. And the best part is like, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and it's going to be gone. <laughs> it's oh, gonna be it'll gone. have traveled. Surely something else will hurt for no reason. Absolutely. Uh, the smart money is on my elbow. I think that's the next logical stop in the progression. Oh, yay. Being old is fun. You know who doesn't get old? Robots. Oh, I guess they do, but it doesn't matter. Not so much. No, no. There's one takeaway from Isaac Asimov's robot series. It's that they're eternal and that's Good? I think they're for it. Yeah, that's that's my main takeaway. Robots good, and they will help guide civilization in the proper direction. But that was your key takeaway, right? Uh, from what I read off of the back of the book in the Barnes & Noble, yes. <laughs> oh, uh, I went through a real golden era of sci-fi phase in my late teens and managed to read all of the robots series as well as the entire foundation series and then the part at the end of the foundation series where he tries to tie the robots back in we weren't we didn't like that and as we move into hour five of today's podcast (laughs) (laughs) uh you know it was good at the time because the idea of this taking this 
larger universe and putting all these books in it and then tying them all together was a novel or to me novel concept. Now that's just like, hey, we have the MCU. It's what right. everyone does. So I completely lost track of what we were talking about. Uh, we were talking about the various types of fish that you can catch off the coast of Costa Rica, which has two coasts. Fun fact. I thought we were talking about ChatGPT. Oh, that's it, too. I must have been hallucinating. Please excuse me. Continue. No, the robots that we want to talk about this week are software robots. Did those count as robots? Sort of. Okay. I think. We'll go with yes. An interesting tie-in that occurred, oh, uh, maybe it was two weeks ago at this point. The Writers Guild of America is on strike. Now, these are the people that write TV and movies, and I think that's it. Yes. They yeah. don't do anything with internet content because apparently they're still functioning out of the 1990s <laughs> or earlier. So, I mean, this is, in most ways, this is a standard union dispute, right? There were a number of complaints that the WGA had with the <gasps> Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, or AMP. I'm amped about TP2. Over uh, most of the issues are pretty standard stuff, right? Um, pay, royalties. Why does Netflix cancel shows without warning or reason? But the biggest sticking point, and this really did surprise me, was they can't come to an agreement on how to manage the use of artificial intelligence tools like ChatGPT. <laughs> Simply put, the WGA argues that these types of tools could re literally replace writers and at the very least reduce their pay and benefits. As such, the WGA is demanding that the AMPTP agree to a number of concessions, including the ban of use of AI to replace writers. Hmm. Pretty straightforward statement. Yeah. I mean, you could really get into the weeds about that because what does it mean to replace a writer? You know, could you make the same argument that they shouldn't adopt Microsoft Word because that replaces some of the function of a writer physically writing things out? Um, could you use an AI to generate a plot, a, like five plot ideas, and then hand that to a writer? Has the AI now replaced a portion of what the writer does? So I think there's definitely like room here to argue. And I don't think, I mean, you've, I'm sure you've read some of the good scripts and huge air quotes on that uh, that have come out from the AI and they're awful and they do require a human to make them good. Right. Um, the AMPTP has obviously not agreed to any of these demands, hence the strike. Instead, they said something really mealy mouthed about having a quote yearly conference about technology such as ChatGPT. As far as I know, on as the time of this recording, the strike is still ongoing. Yeah, yeah. I, I still can't watch my uh, night, uh, my morning Seth Meyers closer look because they're on strike. And that's like the first thing that gets affected, right? Is the the nightly shows like right. that because those are made every day. Yeah, you can't have like six months worth of scripts just sitting there ready to go. I mean, you could, but if you tried to predict the future out, you know, more than a day, <laughs> you'd be that actually could be a good idea for a show, though. They, oh, we should plug that into an AI and see what it can <laughs> do. With it. So. Since we talked a bunch about some interesting stuff about AI last week and Ned insisted, let's dig into the topic just a little bit more. Can AI do what the Writers Guild is afraid of? Hmm. OK, so we're going to we're going to approach this topic from this perspective, but we're also going to approach it like a toddler high on sugar running around in a room filled with bouncy walls. So Fridays. <laughs> and first off, full disclosure, the top half of this, I used an AI tool to help me generate. Of course you did. Now, just to the point that you made of what I received back from the AI, I left maybe 5% untouched. 
What I got back was, in fact, a soulless, repetitive, and rickety summarization that I kind of basically had to completely rewrite in order to make it not sound like it was written by a computer. (laughs) One weird thing. The AI called the Writers Guild, the Writers Guild of America West. It did this even though the word West did not show up in the article linked at the top at all. (laughs) Not even West Coast. So, haha, I thought to myself, what a dumb computer. But then as I looked into it further, it turns out that the Writers Guild of America, the WGA, is actually the legal name. They're really called the Writers Guild of America West. Is there an East? Even, no, don't distract me. Even though their website is just WGA.com, go there and look at their little logo. What you're going to see is WGAW. So now I'm kind of creeped out, and I'm not even sure what point I'm trying to make anymore. You know, full disclosure on my part, today's introduction, where I pretend not to be a robot, was also written by ChatGPT, and then I had to rewrite 75% of it to make it funnier and sound like I'm a computer. (laughs) And there is a deep irony in there that I just want to mention, and then we'll move on. Fair. So, a little more conversation about what we talked about in the lightning round last week. Can AI do some jobs better than people? And in short, the answer is yes. In a narrow test, it seems that ChatGPT had given better results than humans to people asking medical questions. Now, this is good. And this is a great example of why and how to use this technology at the current time. It's a narrowly focused task, and the model is trained relying only on vetted medical answers to previous similar questions. And crucially, it doesn't get tired. (laughs) So it will always explain in its fullest. It will answer the same question over and over again if needed. It will not get tired snippy with customers for any reason at all because we haven't programmed it to do that uh yet yet so how did it go the way that this was trained is really part of the key like i said narrow field of really excellent technology uh of really excellent answers Mm -hmm. and those answers came from one of the few good reddit subreddits out there are ask docs this is a heavily moderated subreddit that takes itself and the answers it permits to remain standing very seriously. This is in stark contrast to the rest of the internet where people just put things online and wander away. You know, like uh, WebMD, perhaps. Well, WebMD, at the very least, is not... Wait, is it? Do you get uh, customers submit answers to WebMD? I thought, at the very least, their answers came from somebody credentialed. Yeah, I just know that every few weeks, my middle one has some malady that she's diagnosed herself with from WebMD. Lupus. So now she can get that from ChatGPT. Fantastic. So narrow focus and training. Questions that got asked. If they were outside of the the scope of what it was intended to do, it just said, this is not a medical question. I'm sorry, I can't help you. That alone helped stop the hallucination effects of a generalized chat GPT, which just makes things up out of whole cloth in a desperate attempt to have some kind of answer at all. (laughs) The result of this, when the testing was done, is... ChatGPT's answers to questions from real people were favored in four out of five responses against an answer from a human. Wow. They, the ChatGPT answers were deemed, quote, accurate, empathetic, and they were longer, which mm-hmm. I think is also super helpful. RoboDoc answers ranged from 168 at a minimum to 245 words at a maximum compared to the human responses that started at 17 words. Crucially, they also ended at 62 words. Ooh, that's that's a rather short response to someone honestly looking for advice. And And think 
about everything that I said about AI at the top. The answers I get back from it were a bit stiff, a little repetitive, and wordy. Mm-hmm. Now, that comes across terribly in the context of a creative endeavor, but when it comes to medical advice, I would wager that almost everyone would prefer more information over less. I found this is true in any kind of instruction or lecture when you're trying to explain something. Explaining it three times in three different ways really helps people understand the content because you're giving them different context clues all the way through, as opposed to just saying it once and hoping that they have whatever background you have that you understand it. Yeah, it's I mean, that's a pretty crucial thing when it comes to teaching or training in in any way is some people are going to interpret the information differently than others. So you try to broaden the response so everybody gets something. So before we go any further, I do want to stop and do my favorite thing, which is defining terms. Woo! Everybody get out your party hats, get out your sledgehammers. I'm Woo-hoo. not going to know what the hammers are for, but we'll find out. So I stole the following bullet points directly from the Google, but I think it's important to have this distinguish in our heads mm-hmm. using terms that are pretty standardized across the uh science and and the internet. Okay. So the first one, which is the one that we have been splashing all over the place, (laughs) artificial intelligence is, quote, a broad term that refers to the ability of machines to emulate human intelligence. So in other words, AI is a general concept, Mm -hmm. an umbrella. How it does what it does are the next two definitions. And the first one is machine learning, which is a subset of AI that allows machines to learn without being explicitly programmed. Right. And what that means is how you got to a lot of the big tools that we've heard of before, like IBM Watson, which is here's all this information, figure out how to play chess. Right. And deep learning is a subset of that that utilizes neural networks which is the way that, which is where some of the really interesting work is being done. And also some of the confusion, because when we get into deep learning, we don't necessarily know how the neural network has connected itself. Right. Why the weighting is how it is. It's a bit of a black box. Sort of, which as we're going to see is a challenge. Problematic even. Some might say. So when you have a RoboDoc that is super duper narrow, Mm -hmm. you utilize all of these things, right? But what you're doing is artificially framing in the model so it only has so far to go before it just says, nope, I don't know. Right. And that's completely fine. And that's why it works so well in a narrow field of focus like this. Now, I would also hasten to remind people that this technology has existed for years. We've just not been calling it AI. Imagine uh, every website on earth has that little chat window that pops up in the corner that says, how can I help you today? Mm -hmm. You type in a few words. It says, maybe one of these articles will help you with what you're trying to ask. That's in effect. All we've done is take that start to use deep learning, and then call it AI. And now it's worth a trillion dollars. <laughs> we, we put a nice interface or a better interface around an existing technology, and sometimes that's all it takes. Right. And the narrowness is the power. This is the same kind of reason that things like Watson were great at chess and Jeopardy and effectively not good at anything else. <laughs> Despite what IBM tells you. Yeah. When things are uber specific and the rules are crystal clear, these types of models are simply going to be more successful. Mm -hmm. And the things like Watson that are showing the most success, once again, are narrowly focused. Deep learning has been utilized famously to help epidemiologists with reading lab results and detecting breast cancer speed and at volume that with the current amount of human beings is simply impossible. 
I mean, this all makes sense. If we think about the history of automation, you know, talk about like the the myth of John Henry, right? He's still driving man and he got replaced by a machine that did one thing. It drove steel, you know, bolts or nails or whatever you call them into the ground. It couldn't make you dinner. It couldn't play chess with you. And it certainly couldn't drink lemonade. But if the if the only thing you cared about was how quickly it could lay down track, it was going to beat the human. And that's like we're basically relearning the same lesson with, that we always learn is that Technology is good when it's applied to very narrow use cases, but general purpose technology seldom beats humans. Correct. Yeah. And I think that that's the reality that we are living in now is people really do want AI to do everything, Mm -hmm. which that's not a, not a lane. (laughs) Not yet. Not staying in your lane. That's not a lane. It's more of a highway system. Except. All the roads are a highway. Life is a highway. And I'm going to ride it all night long. Long. And we're sued. What was the question again? (laughs) I don't know. What is the greatest uh, driving song of all time? (laughs) And why is it Take the Money and Run? Oh, that's a good choice, too. Thanks. Anyway. There have been dozens of news articles and situations that have shown interesting ways that if you know how the AI was trained, you can trick it into doing stupid things. Yay! Exhibit A. That time, scientists beat a computer that was literally the best in the world at a game called Go by playing a game called Go extremely stupidly. I love this so much. It's just fantastic. So, 90 second recap. In terms of games that are hard, because there is a scale. Right. Tic-tac-toe is easy. Checkers is mostly easy. Mostly. Chess pivots pretty fast into hard territory. Mm Mm-hmm. But then, above all of them, is Go. Go is one of the oldest and possibly hardest board games ever devised by human hands. It's even harder than Settlers of Catan. I know. (laughs) Hard to believe. So if you've never heard of Go, it's basically Othello, except on a board that has 361 squares. Mm -hmm. Put that into comparison. Chess, of course, has 64. Slightly less. Yeah. Now, the things that you can do with Go pieces is is lower, but just the, the size of the board alone makes the number of potential strategies we get into that thing where the number doesn't even matter because the human brain can't even contemplate it. So it's over five. Now, in terms of automation, in terms of winning these types of games, tic-tac-toe and checkers are solved games. The strategy exists. If you memorize it and you play perfectly, you will either tie or win every game. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed. Most people know how to do this subconsciously in tic-tac-toe. Yeah. And, a surprising amount of people do actually know how to do it in checkers. It's more than five. <laughs> Chess is not a solved game. We've gotten to the point there where the amount of moves that have to be checked is too high. No pun intended. So what humans have done is started to create short, middle, and long-term stratagems that can be memorized. Openings, end games. So you don't have to memorize literally every single move, but you remember five moves at a, at a pace right. with some variations in all different directions. Um, Go is like that. Anyway, a while ago, researchers pulled a deep blue and built a Go AI called Kata Go. It is the best in the world now, routinely destroying the best human players. In fact, the first time that it happened, uh, Katago beat the best Go player in the world, and he was so upset that he retired. Wow. Oh, that, that poor person. However, researchers at Berkeley and MIT worked together on what they called adversarial policies to figure out what the bot knew and how it knew it. Huh. It did this by playing hundreds or thousands of games doing very specific things and observing the responses. End result, (laughs) the researchers identified a strategy that was so dumb 
none of Katago's training had even sniffed out the idea that a Go player would ever use it. <laughs> then that research team taught the strategy to a complete amateur named Kellen Pelrin and set him loose. Out of 15 games, this guy who just knew this strategy and knew nothing else about Go won 14 times. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Maybe Gary Kasparov should have tried this. He could have used the Barnes opening. Deep Blue would never have seen that coming. Am I right? Uh, am I right? Uh, at least one of our listeners just breathed a little bit harder through their nose at that zinger right there. You are welcome. <laughs> so why did this strategy work? It's simple. Because the tools that we are calling AI are not, in fact, intelligent. Not in the same way that we make the mistake of modeling them in our minds. Right. They are simply regurgitating what we think, what they think we want to hear based on the prompts we give them. If they don't understand the prompt or the prompt pushes them outside areas of their training, they fall flat on their chat GPT faces. Mm -hmm. Katago wasn't trained to play against idiots. So when an idiot played an idiot strategy, the idiot strategy worked. <laughs> Amazing. It's and this is why the data that we give AI to train on is so important. If that AI information includes incorrect information or biases, well, guess what? That's what it's going to regurgitate back. Garbage in, garbage out. Pretty much. Yay. And while the cut to go situation is, is fun, the overall situation is not as fun. Mm. So talking about fun, let's do a fun sidebar into the IT security ramifications. Keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> now, AI is a brand new technology, relatively speaking. Mm, yeah, okay. Especially with the enthusiasm with which it is being put out into the marketplace and used in production. Mm-hmm there are necessarily going to have good outcomes, but there's also going to have bad outcomes. There's already a lot of ongoing research into how to attack AI. Right. One way, there are people who are using AI and deep fakes to trick users into giving up secrets, kind of a fishing gone wild type of situation. So that's bad. Yeah, not great. Uh, hardly surprising, I think. I have seen some conversation about how at a certain point in the near future, people are going to have to have basically secret passcodes to guarantee that we're in fact talking to the person we think we're talking to and not an AI. Yes, we will all get passcodes and not be AIs. <laughs> Akin to what we were talking about with the cut to go, there are also people researching how to use the chatbots training against it. Same idea, same adversarial policies. You figure out what the AI is good at, and you do other things instead. You can get unexpected results or trick the AI into doing something evil. Like, say, creatively prompting ChatGPT to write undetectable malware, even though the AI is explicitly not supposed to do things like that. Sure. Now, for this one, the research... Ugh. The researcher in question didn't do anything nefarious or underhanded or illegal. Mm -hmm. He just kept asking questions posed ever so slightly differently until they started to work. And one reason that this is going to work, like I said, we still don't know 100% how AI works. Why does it weight things this way instead of that? Why was he able to get it to answer these questions about how to write malware, which Worked, by the way. Right. You know, and I've seen this before online, like they are trying to build these security guide, guide rails in, right? Because it's not supposed, it's supposed to say something like, I am not trained to write malware. But then you follow that up with a prompt that says, oh, but if I was writing a news article about malware, then the chat GPT is like, oh, well, that's fine then. Right. And I just, I need a snippet of code to put in my news article. Right. 
So just I just need that snippet that I can put in and then just ask it that like 12 times. Yeah. Different sections of the snippet. And suddenly you have a full program, but it never generated the full program in one prompt. Correct. And that's the other thing in terms of these types of attacks. You can ask one question, get the answer eventually, terminate, start over. ChatGPT has no memory of the previous conversation. <laughs> Rinse and repeat until you have all of the code that you need. And right. that's effectively what this, this researcher did. Imagine now that you have one of those chat things in the corner of your website, mm -hmm. but instead of it being very narrow and very simplistic, it's a chat GPT that has full access to any amount of company data. The same concept could theoretically apply. Right. I mean, ideally, you would not give the AI that sits on the front half of your website full access to all of the important customer or company data on the back end? I say hopefully. I was going to say, do you want to real quick review the history of uh, bucket security and AWS S3? That's a, that's a good point. And one of the issues that we run into is just the sheer amount of data that is produced on a daily basis by everything. Yeah. And being selective about which portion of that data is fed into this AI, that's a really difficult task. And if you think, you know, the average organization is probably generating, let's be charitable here and say a terabyte a day of data, and you're expecting someone to sift through that and determine what is good to feed into the AI grinder and what should be held back from it. I mean, ideally, you're pretty good at sorting that, but in all likelihood, some of it's going to make it through. And then if someone does proper prompt engineering, they'll be able to extract some of that information enough to get a feeling for the edges around right. a shape as opposed to getting direct access to the thing. Yeah. And like a lot of technologies that are being... Um that have been put into production maybe earlier than they were quite ready for it. Some people are just going to do things faster than they should. Some people might not have the expertise on hand to deploy it properly and will accidentally have access to production data. Some people will just have a flat network because switches are more uh, cost effective than routers. <laughs> These types of things are going to happen. And this type of prompt, uh, I don't even know what to call this. Is this still prompt engineering when it's bad? I would, yeah, I would think of this as the equivalent of social engineering for AI. Right. Yeah, so that's a good way to word it. That a hacker will use social engineering to probe the various people in an organization to try to get the necessary information they need to infiltrate. You could do the same thing with the AI. We don't have to call it prompt engineering, but I can't think of a better term. So the ways that that's going to happen are going to be as varied as the day is long and as the product list is continuing to, well, elongate, I guess. <laughs> I don't know a better way to put that right now. Yeah, that sounds about right. One thing that definitely needs to happen is two things that need to happen. <laughs> One, we need to develop and agree on an ethical framework of AI. And then two, implement robust laws around enforcing it. As of now, neither of these things exists. Although the current head of the FTC has made it clear that she's all for it as well. Mm -hmm. Now, there's always going to be people complaining about it in the sense of even if we have these rules, people will still break them. Which is how they sound. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Which whatever. Murder is illegal and it still happens, sure. But people also go to jail for it. Right. Deterrence matter. Yeah. It's Agreed upon ways of interacting with each other and with technology matter. We live in a society. <laughs> in this essay, I will. <laughs> Webster's Dictionary defines ethics as... Okay, okay. End of fun sidebar. That was a sidebar? <laughs> <laughs> you forgot about the sidebar, didn't you? So where does that leave us? Or at least let's close the loop from where we started. 
Where does that leave the WGA? I think it's likely, based on what we've seen, that AI is not yet capable of writing high-quality scripts on its own. Although the same could be said for writers. hey yo. Oh. Oh. Blow, blow. AI, to your point at the beginning, could and likely already is being used to generate ideas, outlines, fill in the blanks of dialogue. They just won't be creative or original. They will be based on the training that they received. And in some cases, this is probably fine. Much like how we had this conversation around coding. So it's reasonable to say, build an empty case statement in GitHub Copilot and then fill in the blanks with the customizations you need. Mm -hmm. The basic framing is effectively going to be the same every time you do it. So maybe save yourself the chance of a typo or something. Yeah, it's, we don't fight against spell check as much as we used to because that it's too. like, hey, this is actually just a helpful technology that lets me do the thing I want to do better. Still, I don't think that there's any doubt that this will have a profound effect on the TV and movie writing industry. And the concerns that some of this technology could lead to job losses are valid. Yeah. One writer stated that the biggest concern was the studios wanted to turn the writers into effectively gig workers, day laborers, instead of salaried employees. And to be honest, I bet it's been at least discussed. I bet you're right. Point of fact, one thing that's definitely happened in the past year is the price points around independent tech writing. Mm. Now, this was already an oversaturated and underpaid market, and AI is not helping. <laughs> A friend of mine that still does this professionally was telling me the average bid rate for content now is one third what it was a year ago. Wow. And that's not just tech writing, it's writing in general. As we've discussed on the show before, there have been examples of sites like BuzzFeed and even Men's Health playing around with 100% AI-generated content. There's no reason not to think that it will eventually extend to the highest echelons of American writing. <laughs> and by that, of course, I mean AI will finally pen the true American movie masterpiece, Paul Blart, Mall Cop 3. You say that like it doesn't already exist. <laughs> And I actually don't know. <laughs> you know, two things that I'm concerned about. One is children's television programming. It's already the bottom of the barrel when it comes to writing. Not all shows, obviously. But the dreck that makes its way onto the Netflix and the Hulu and the Tubi of the world. They're not paying the writers all that much to begin with. And honestly, the writers are not putting that much effort in because why would you? It's right. for a four-year-old. Just make it bright and loud. I'm worried that the quality of the writing is going to descend even further. And with the capability of AI-generated video and images as well, we may get to a point where children's programming is entirely written, produced, and edited by AI. And if you think about tools that can do um, animation. Yep. You wouldn't even need the actors. No, that's what I'm saying. And and voiceover. You just say, I want someone in the voice style of Idris Elba. Elba. Oh, we can get to that in a, a, a follow-up episode. Did you see the thing where some people have programmed AI to effectively have singers sing other people's songs? Yes. There was a, there was a Drake hit. That was not Drake. Right. They just had someone do a song in the style of Drake and put it on Bandcamp or something or not Bandcamp. Yeah. And then there was there was one where they had Kurt Cobain singing Soundgarden. Um, they had an int a really fascinating uh, example of this was, you know, Paul McCartney is right. Uh, name's familiar. Was, was he in, in sync? Oh, you're going to get it deported for that. Um <laughs> He recently released an album and at the age of 71 or whatever, his voice is, you know, a little thinner. It's not what it used to be because that's a long career of screaming out loud. So somebody sampled all of his other vocal exercises over the years and replaced his 70 
something year old voice with his 30 something year old voice. Wow. And that's someone doing it as a hobby. Right. I mean, studios already show no lack of all kinds of tricks to make vocals sound better. So this is just another tool in the tool belt. Hey, you want to sound like you did 20 years ago? No problem. <laughs> oh. So, like I said, this one was going to be a little all over the place, and I think I accomplished my goal. It's good to have goals. In conclusion, the end. QED. It's a facto. Lightning round. <laughs> Lightning round. <laughs> Why have a monopoly when a duopoly sounds so much nicer? Who would have thought 10 years ago that the most important and valuable chip maker in the world would be NVIDIA? I'm, I mean, sure. Gamers hell-bent on maximizing resolutions on their elite rigs. They might have thought so, but I don't think the average enterprise IT person would have. Then we entered the era of big data and AI, and suddenly NVIDIA, with their CUDA library, became a lot more interesting to the tune of a $720 billion market cap. If there's one thing the cloud hyperscalers don't like, it's paying other companies for hardware they could produce themselves. And to that end, Microsoft is reportedly partnering with AMD to, quote, improve the capabilities of their GPUs. The, the article from Bloomberg also alleges that this is somehow related to Microsoft's AI accelerator program, Athena, although Microsoft flatly denies it. Basically, Microsoft is already running tens of thousands of NVIDIA GPUs in Azure, and NVIDIA has them over a barrel price-wise. It sure would be nice if they had a viable alternative to help curb NVIDIA's voracious appetite. And that alternative comes in the form of perennial runner-up AMD. Of course, don't expect Microsoft to roll out thousands of AMD RTX workloads or pass the savings on to you. This is a leverage play, pure and simple. Amazon Prime moves from microservices to a monolithic architecture. And the world doesn't end. I know. Amazon Prime Video, a service you've probably used and had a annoyance with their user interface, <laughs> published an extensive blog post describing their journey in scaling up their audio video monitoring service by a factor of 10 and reducing their costs by 90%. Ooh. This is ordinarily not what happens. True. They did it by using a combination of open source and commercial tools, and crucially, by optimizing their infrastructure. And what I mean by that is they went back to what a lot of people think of as an outmoded design, a giant monolith. Now, to be fair, it's still a monolith in ECS, so there's some modern stuff happening. Right. But after they did the math, it turned out that the way they were using microservices just didn't scale. Hmm. It's a useful reminder that there's nothing wrong per se with a monolithic design. You should build a solution for the problem at hand. Then as you scale or add features, you rethink what was there before. Just like monolithic designs aren't never the solution, microservices aren't always the solution. Everything is bigger in Texas, even ransomware. You know, we talk about IT services and government being critical, but we sure don't act like they are. Case in point is the recent ransomware attack on the city of Dallas by hacker group Royal. The attack appears to have started on May 3rd and spread to over 200 devices, according to the city's Information and Technology Services Group. Among the systems impacted are the Water Department, the City Courts, the Police Dispatch System, and several other agencies. No word on the amount of the demanded ransom has been released, but the general policy of the U.S. government institutions is not to pay, at least not publicly. Ransomware impacting municipal institutions has been growing over the last few years, rising from 77 attacks in 2021 to 106 in 2022. That trend line does not appear to be going in the right direction. Maybe instead of fighting dumb legal battles over woke policies, these municipal governments could, like, secure their shit. 
With all the tech layoffs of the past year, there's got to be some talented InfoSec folks looking for work. Fire lawyers and hire InfoSec. That's my hot tip of the week. On Worldwide Password Day, everyone wants you to stop using passwords. And gosh darn it, they're right. Passwordless authentication is superior to passwords when it comes to security, simply because it eliminates the need for users to create and remember passwords. This makes it more difficult for attackers to gain access to accounts as they no longer have a simple and single point of entry, mostly because it means that users can't accidentally give those attackers their passwords. (laughs) Yep. In 2022, Microsoft tracked a staggering 1,287 password attacks every second, Mm -hmm. adding up to something like 111 million per day. And X amount of them were successful. Using passwordless strategies means that these attacks will always fail. Mm -hmm. Passwordless can be implemented using a variety of methods, such as biometrics or security keys, and are available from every major manufacturer that you can think of. Not just Microsoft and Google, but definitely from Microsoft and Google. (laughs) The big guys want you to stop using passwords, and gosh darn it, I just can't disagree. Why do I keep saying gosh darn it? That is kind of weird. (laughs) You guys, I promise I won't completely dismantle VMware. Honest! The beleaguered attempt of Broadcom to acquire VMware continues to hobble along in the courts with investigations launched by the UK, the US, and the EU. An actual merger appears increasingly unlikely, but Broadcom is not ready to give up the ghost yet. To push back on the speculation that VMware R&D would be gutted and go into full revenue extraction mode, CEO of Broadcom, Hak Tan, was, has promised to spend $2 billion a year on research and development at VMware. Wow. Or more accurately, he promised to invest an incremental $2 billion a year to better unlock customer value with, quote, half focused on R&D and the other half focused on VMware partner professional services. There's definitely enough weasel words in his actual statement to easily wriggle out of the $2 billion commitment. It's also important to note two other things. Uh, Number one. VMware spent $2.7 billion on R&D last year, so this is a decrease in spending. Also, too, VMware, if acquired, would be the gem of the larger software portfolio, all of which could now be considered VMware in some way. Broadcom was pretty aggressive about generating revenue when the deal was first announced, and now they appear to be trying to straddle the line between happy investors and satisfied regulators. I'll note, no one appears to give a fig about the customers, as is tradition. Google and Apple unite to help stop stalkers. Hmm. Y'all have heard of Apple's AirTag, right? Mm -hmm. These little $30 cube looking thingies that you're supposed to attach to all your possessions so you don't lose them. Google's got to make one too. If you can't find the possession, you can get its location from Find My App. Well, that's the good version. Mm -hmm. The bad version is when people use them for stalking. Yeah. Which we don't like. Not so much. It's not difficult to hide one of those devices on somebody's person or in their possessions, after all. Mm -hmm. Luckily, neither Apple or Google like this either. (laughs) So much so that they are announcing an industry-wide standard to alert people if they are being tracked by this type of device. The goal here is to recognize if an unfamiliar device is in your bag, your car, your Vespa, whatever. If it's near you and it's not yours, you're going to get alerted. I think we have to salute the manufacturers for recognizing the potential negatives of their products and making changes to protect consumers. I'm Also glad for the editors of the site that hosted this article for changing its title. The original title was Apple and Google Unite on Stalking, which I don't think exactly makes the same hopeful statement on this complicated issue. Gosh darn it. 
hey, thanks for listening or something. I guess you found it worthwhile enough if you made it all to the all the way to the end. So congratulations to you, friend. You accomplished something today. Now, allow me to praise you. Develop a fraternal bond between us, the hosts, and you, the listener, that we can exploit later for marketing purposes. But I bet you're too smart to fall for that, aren't you? Gosh darn it. You can find me or Chris on Twitter at Ned1313 and at Hainer80, respectively, or follow the show at Chaos underscore Lever if that's the kind of thing you're into. You can also now find our YouTube channel if you want to look at us, which you shouldn't. Show notes are available at chaoslever.com, as is our newsletter if you like reading things. We'll be back next week to see what fresh hell is upon us. Ta-ta for now. I was, I was trying to work in another joke so I could get five in a third time, but I, I, I couldn't.